Hello and welcome to Upper Pen. My name is Dakota and today I'm talking with Stephanie Burgess about her books, Scales and Sensibility and Claws and Contrivances. Thank you for joining me, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I really, I love these books so much, but the first thing I ever read by you was Good Neighbors. And oh, yay. I was like, oh my gosh, you're one of my favorites now. <laughs> That makes me really happy. Thank you so much, especially because I think Good Neighbors and the Regency Dragons books as being at slightly different ends of my personal spectrum. So I'm really happy that you love both. Um, so, okay, for people who don't know what the Regency Dragon books are, do you have a little rundown for them? Sure. So in my Regency Dragons trilogy, which um, I've got the second book has just come out now, Claws and Contrivances, it, three sisters in Regency England have been scattered across the, in the UK in the wake of their parents' death. And they all have to go as poor relations to one or another reluctant relative. <laughs> and the thing that makes it different from, you know, Jane Austen style rom-com is that in this version of Regency England during the Napoleonic Wars, as uh, the British Navy was uh, traveling all around uh, South America and so on, uh, they came across dragons still alive, not magical, everyone assumes, <laughs> but, you know, and very, very small, but definitely dragons dragons and that has had a big impact on British society because small pet dragons are just the right size for sitting on a lady's shoulder they are the new favorite ornament of high society <laughs> and as it turns out there's a lot that all these dragon scholars who are so sure these dragons can't possibly really be magical there's a lot they haven't figured out yet <laughs> so in the first one I think one of the best descriptions of um these inter the introduction of the dragons to Regency society is when Eleanor's cousin has the dragon poop on her. Yes. Um, <laughs> how do you just train a wild animal? But like, I guess people had parrots and stuff. So yeah, I'm actually right now I'm in the middle of reading the recollections of Mary Somerville, who's very famous uh, 19th century mathematician one of the first really, you know, famous women mathematicians. And she's talking about all the various birds, actually, the women in her family had had as pets. So she personally had a house sparrow who sat on her shoulder and she said ate from her mouth, which is a little far from me, but you know, it, it was a very close pet for eight years. And her aunt had a tawny owl um, in the seaside Scottish village where she grew up. A lot of the women apparently had tame gulls who were pets, seagulls, which I can't imagine. So think you know they have that was a period when in real life people were having some pretty strange pets. Oh, and including squirrels in America were quite a common pet in the late eighteenth century. I mean, I guess. <laughs> so our dogs terrify the squirrels here. I can't imagine them ever coming inside. <laughs> Honestly, I grew up in a part of Michigan where the squirrels are very large and aggressive. And I can't imagine wanting one as a pet. <laughs> but yeah, me either. But like I've seen videos of them online. And I'm like, that's cute. It's like a small weird cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and actually in my my upcoming next children's book, uh, The Raven Throne, one of the kids does end up with a red squirrel as their companion, and I had to really think about how I can make that plausible you know, for people like me who maybe didn't grow up with squirrels as the things you think of as being sweet or cuddly. You know? um, so, okay, the dragons in these books are non-magical. Officially. <laughs> Officially. Um, but they're also tiny, right? Because how can, mm -hmm. you know, they have to sit on someone's shoulder. Um, so how did you come to this dragon, I guess? Why not a silly creature or like, why dragons? <laughs> well, you know, I've always been obsessed with dragons. I mean, to the point where when I was a kid, you know, I can't count how many dragons I doodled on restaurant napkins and things, <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's been a thing. Recently, I was looking through an old folder I had of short stories, you know, that I've been writing for the last, oh God, I don't know how many years in my <laughs> current computer are kept on there, but certainly as far back as 2002. And, you know, it's astonishing how many dragon short stories I wrote back then also. I do have an obsession with dragons. Um, 
this is my second dragon focused trilogy my first one was for children it was a very different take on dragons it was dragons with being huge and scary and you know etc these are the sweet small <laughs> officially non-magical dragons so it was just playing with a different angle you know thinking what would be fun what would be and it was also a little bit of an homage to i love terry pratchett's books um and when I was much younger, uh, my favorite of his books that I discovered as a teenager was Guards, Guards. <laughs> and I don't know, if you, have you read that one? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, there's the little swamp dragons who ride on the lady's shoulders. And <laughs> that was like, and I was like, oh, my God, yes, that would be the perfect thing to introduce into Regency England. <laughs> and so that was my, I would not compare myself to Terry Pratchett. He was amazing, you know, but that's my little homage to Terry Pratchett. I love the blending, though, of the type of humor that you'd find in, like, a Terry Pratchett tongue-in-cheek humor with the, like, Jane Austen storytelling elements, because you really do write this in, like, Regency language, which I found so fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I imprinted really early on Jane Austen because I was a very geeky kid. And my dad read me Pride and Prejudice when I was eight, if you can believe it. And I loved it. And I then read all of her other novels. And I was in middle school. I was like obsessively reading uh, 19th century books, which did not help me fit in. I have to tell you, mm -hmm. but it was, um, yeah, so it was just so obvious when I, you know, grew up and I knew I wanted to be a writer. It's just nothing sounded more fun than getting to mix together fantasy and historical, you know, because I love both of those so much. Yeah. I love how um, in Claws and Contrivances, the main character, um, Rose, she's living with her uncle and her uncle is a dragon scholar, but he's like a, a factual, or not factual, but he's like a, a folklore dragon scholar. Yeah. Um, and I love how he's like, all these dragons are going to be magic, and they're all like these lore <laughs> stories. And um, everybody's like, yeah, sure they are, sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. He's totally the nutty uncle, you know? <laughs> uh, so I love that mix, too, of like, all of these elements like kind of came together and made like such a wonderful, funny, but cozy book. Oh, uh, thank you. And the characters are so funny. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> in the first one, uh, Eleanor decides that she needs to be someone else, so mm -hmm. her dragon transforms her visually, mm -hmm. but then, um, you can still touch Eleanor, mm -hmm. and then she has to do her hair, and I think it's <laughs> yep. like, the funniest thing I was thinking of. I was like, how would you... <laughs> Yes, it's just so awkward because you once you start thinking about that kind of magical spell illusion you know, sort of thing, think well, how would you do these little things that seem really you know practical and yet you know impossible? Um, yeah. Um, so I really like the contrast of Rose and Eleanor in these first two books mm -hmm. too, because they're both like they. Uh, Eleanor is very serious. She's always mm -hmm. been serious, and Rose has changed since her parents died. Um, mm -hmm. But they're so unique in the way they handle mm -hmm. things. It's very fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, and I loved, I mean, the first book is called Scales and Sensibility. And honestly, the plot, if anything, has probably more to do with Mansfield Park, if you're going to get to, <laughs> like, Jane Austen specific about it. But part of that was just a little homage to the idea of these sisters who like the Dashwood sisters in um, Sense and Sensibility, you know, have to leave their old home. And in this case, it's, you know, it's worse, but it's, there's the sensible oldest sister and there's the more romantic, you know, middle sister. And then there's the younger sister who I'm giving a lot more time to, you know, than Austin did, but. I love that the younger sister's a mathematician. I mean, yes. <laughs> That's so fantastic. I can't wait for her own book. So thank uh, you. Well, it's going to be a while, but I am already in the research phase and I'm reading all of, like I said, I think earlier I was, I'm reading the autobiography of one British woman mathematician from her time period. And I've got a whole pile of other research books to get it so that I can sort her character out because I have to say, when I wrote the first book, I was like, oh yeah, and the youngest sister Harry's a mathematician. That's great. You know, I like that idea. 
And then you get to her book, you're like, oh, so I need to know exactly what she would be obsessed with in 1817. And I am not a math horse historian or even a mathematician. And I'm very lucky that actually my parents are both mathematicians. So I have been getting them to give me suggestions for people to look up. And, you know, they did actually study some of the history of math on the way in their own careers. But it's it's a stretch for me, too. My fiance is really into math. He is a, a math Ooh. major and um, he he likes to watch math documentaries, which go way over my head. But I'm like, oh, that's lovely. <laughs> lovely <Yeah. math>. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's a line in Claws and Contrivances where Rose, who is not at all interested in mathematics, is saying, yes, of course, I listen to Harry talk about mathematics because she loves it and I love her. So why wouldn't I want to hear her talk about what she's excited about, you know? Yeah, and they're so sweet to one another. Um, are they all going to meet up at some point or are they all going to stay separate? Well, you never know. <laughs> um, I did actually just uh, last month, I, I decided Claws and Contrivances, when I finished the first draft, I was sort of torn about whether it was all feeling complete or whether it needed an epilogue. And I sent it out to some critiquers and I said, what do you think? Do you think it needs an epilogue or not? Because I'd never done one for my earlier books. Um, and pretty much everyone came back and said, it definitely doesn't need an epilogue, but you know, I wouldn't mind reading one. <laughs> you know, be So I actually have written an optional epilogue, which is set three years after Claws and Contrivances. Um, it's going to be going out on Patreon on August 1st and then going out for free to all of my newsletter subscribers later in the year. And that one, I can tell you, it has at least two of the sisters gathered. <laughs> you know, we'll see what happens by the end of book three. Perfect. That's, you know, that's good. I love extra weird, like, I never planned to write this, but here you go. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Absolutely. <laughs> um I loved Mr. Aubrey in Claws. Oh, yay. He so in the first one he's very silly um cuz mm -hmm. he's like he doesn't want to talk to anybody just please don't talk to me. And then mm -hmm. um Rose is such an enigmatic person. She's just happy and you will do what she's asking. Um Yes, you yeah. certainly will. <laughs> I loved those like two playing together and it was just like really fun to watch their relationship. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm um, so happy to hear that. Well, the funny thing is when I wrote book one and I had Mr. Aubrey as a side character in there because he's you know best friend of the hero. So he's sort of along for the ride and then helpfully providing some dragon related information as a scholar. Um, but my idea when I first started writing book one was I was like oh he's got a lot in common with the youngest sister maybe I'll match him up you know in th book three and I um and then I got to book two and I was trying to come up with a love interest for Rose and I was like why isn't anything clicking and then I thought wait a second <laughs> what if Mr. Aubrey does not need to be with someone who's exactly the same as him what if Mr. Aubrey needs to be with someone who's completely different from him and they and like immediately they started striking sparks in my mind and there was so much chemistry and it just made so much sense immediately so I will say you have a penchant for putting these poor girls in mud um, <laughs> yes <laughs> <laughs> so both girls get knocked over by the same carriage <laughs> This is true. And I was trying to decide whether I needed to have the same carriage knock over the third girl or whether Rose would have taken care of that problem by the third book, you know, because I, I think Rose is need... quite practical. Yeah. Do they need a new driver? Is he just not seeing them? What's happening? <laughs> he is a very careless driver. And I think Rose is going to take charge and make sure no more accidents happen. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought it was hilarious that it was the same carriage. I was like, yeah, that would happen too. I bet. <laughs> because this is not a guy who's careful when he drives and Mr. Aubrey who is the owner of the carriage is not noticing how the drive is going at all because he's busy reading in the carriage he doesn't look outside <laughs> so sure. my yes the, the conclusion I've tentatively come to is that there won't be a carriage accident in the third book because once Rose and Mr. Aubrey are together she's going to take charge and this is this problem will not happen again um, uh, I love Mr. Aubrey's intense 
statements that magic is not real. They just don't mm -hmm. know how it works yet. And I thought this yes. was a fun concept because in Regency England, people were like, magic doesn't exist. We have to find the science of things. Exactly. Um, and I thought it was just like a perfect way to do a dragon book. Like they're not magical. Come on. <laughs> Yes. And Rose's uncle, who, who's studying the folklore, he's like, he's like, gotta be magic. Where else did all these stories come from? Versus all of the very sensible, practical scholars like Mr. Aubrey are like, come on, you know, we don't believe in magic. The enlightenment has happened where, you know, we know there is a logic to the universe there, et cetera. You know, and it, because yeah, I mean, if we discovered something that looked like dragons now, every scientist is still would say, absolutely, you know, not magic. This is just maybe the restore maybe people thought like people say now like oh maybe dragon stories came from the bones of dinosaurs and they were trying to come up with an explanation you know we would always come up with some story to explain why it couldn't really have been magic yeah he's just like a really fun character to put in this setting where dragons have recently been discovered this is not a new this is not like a well established thing um <laughs> so he's just like a fun character to hang out with i think um, but he's so quiet. So I was always like, he's going to say something, right? Cause she's doing some sillies and <laughs> he's just going with it. <laughs> yep. But when it finally comes to, you know, push comes to shove, he's actually going to not budge on the things that actually really matter to him <laughs> and she's going to have to back down. Yeah. It's just Rose hurting herself really. She's like, please don't do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, yes, he says it's not logical to think that you are the only person in the universe who doesn't need protection. That's not that's not a thing. <laughs> but it was I feel for Rose though, because like when you're a kid and something tragic happens, you tend to mm -hmm. try to help everyone. Um uh, so Absolutely. Like, she's just such a relatable character, her and Eleanor. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I think I was trying to decide if I had more in common with which one of them and you know originally I mean I've got there's some of me in both of them I'm an oldest child so you know I do have the you're the oldest you know be responsible kind of background yeah. but on the other hand you know I I am a big fan of making plans and making lists <laughs> like Rose I want to organize life so that it can't go wrong <laughs> well um Rose's oldest cousin is very very nonsensical <laughs> yes <laughs> um, her, and poor Rose having to deal with the extreme of because she used to be quite romantic before you know tragedy hit the family and she had to sort of wise up but now she's having to deal with that and her cousin Serena <laughs> well Serena lays down in ruins and I love that the first one is very like um sense and Scales and Sensibility feels very much like a Jane Austen book and like um, Mansfield Park, like you said. And then the mm. second one is very Northanger Abbey with like yes. a weird castle and the grounds and nobody knows what's happening. Um, <laughs> I almost called it Dragon Abbey. That was my first working title. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be cool. But, you know, I like claws and contrivances, though, because it's Rose goes through a lot of oh yeah <laughs> steps to get to where she goes. <laughs> um, but Serena plays into that like gothic female character of that time period so well. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes and I mean the real gothic novels of the time period are so much fun and I had so much fun researching them before writing this book especially um you know Rose's aunt Serena's mother writes gothic novels and so I was reading up a lot of you know about the real women gothic novelists of Wales in the time period and the kind of stories and they're so dramatic and they're so amazing you know it's you can absolutely see how if you're s sitting bored out of your mind you know in the middle of the countryside with no money to do anything or go anywhere like why wouldn't you wish yourself into this wonderful gothic novel where it's full of mystery and adventure and romance they even move into a converted abbey that is mm -hmm. kind of crumbling <laughs> they <do> yes fear <laughs> absolutely um so yes and rose is the only one who's like wait you know, the walls are crumbling maybe we should do something 
Yeah, and I can't tell if that family has always lived there and they just don't notice it anymore or if it's just because they are so romantically inclined that they're like, it's character. <laughs> well, my feeling for what it's worth <laughs> is that that was the family home. It has disintegrated over time. Uh, and the aunt, who is far more practical than her husband, <laughs> would like to fix it, but doesn't have the money and has decided not to worry about it. <laughs> and the cousins it doesn't even occur to them they're like yeah it's home and whereas rose comes in having never been there before is like oh my god this place is falling apart and she even mentions a few times when like something dramatic is happening she's like oh god did the ceiling fall and hit someone and they're like no why would that happen <laughs> it's ridiculous <laughs> yeah why would the house do something like that don't be so absurd you <laughs> know it's funny that they're you... very yeah Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just saying, they're a very loving family. They're a very creative family. They are not a very practical family. <laughs> no, yeah. So what I was going to say is I find it funny that you call the aunt the practical one um, of the two parents. <laughs> <laughs> because she is not it's, at all practical either. <laughs> it's a very low bar, you know, basically. <laughs> True. I love the part where you pulled in the rest of the community and they all have to do a play. And it's, of course, a contrived thing to, like, make Rose and um, Mr. Aubrey, like, fall in love. <laughs> and all the people are taking this dramatic play very seriously, and they've done it so many times. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so. That was the kind of thing people did, because, you know, you needed entertainment. There was no TV. There was no radio. You did, it was fantastic you come do these big readings they've been perform little you know people play charades they would do all these things they had to come up with their own entertainment and it's so much fun to put that actually sort of make that happen with the over the top reading of aunt perry's latest gothic novel which is you know, just ridiculous but you know i'm honestly surprised that she didn't pull down the costumes from the attic and make everybody put on a wig or something um yeah. i'm positive she she had more time to prepare <laughs> Oh, yeah, I suppose she made her daughters write all the scripts. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so I can't, I don't know which one I like more. I, I think I love them both the same. Um, mm -hmm. Tales and sensibility and claws and contrivances. But I love the magic that the dragon in Scales and Sensibility has where um, it's it's the transforming the image of someone. Mm -hmm. uh, or like uh it it wasn't just that it was a wish magic right anytime she yeah said, absolutely yeah and then the aunt in the first one um with Eleanor she hasn't <laughs> she hasn't interjected with the family at all and Eleanor mm -hmm. makes a wish that she would just speak her mind and <laughs> holy crow <laughs> yes she has had a lot going on behind her you know, silent you know face I hope <laughs> that she just going. gave up years ago <laughs> I hope she just kept doing that after um, Eleanor left and she was just like, no, this is how it is now. <laughs> absolutely. That was that was absolutely my plan. She was going to go off with her old friend and live in London and have a good time and speak her mind with other old women. <laughs> it's such an interesting like um, dynamic because usually when I think of character like women in this time period I think of like Mrs. Bennett who very much mm -hmm. runs the household and her daughters for the most part come to her for permission to do things really instead of their dad um right in that household it was you do not talk to the mother she just doesn't she doesn't care don't ask anything <laughs> Yeah, she just, she gave up years ago. She just checked out from life. And actually that that one, I was kind of thinking of one of the ants in Mansfield Park. Um, the one who's, I think it's, is it, oh God, what's her name? Lady something or other. She is officially the lady of the house, but she just lies back and she pets her pug. And, you know, she, it's just too much trouble to deal well, with things. So her trolls and <laughs> so much noise. <laughs> <laughs> I would probably check out too, honestly. Um, it's a lot going on. <laughs> um, so cozy fantasy feels like it's on the rise right now. Has that impacted? Yes. You? 
Well, I'm just really happy about it because honestly, it's the stuff I've always loved. It's what I always have felt happiest writing. Um, and I had, well, publishers in particular have very strongly pushed in the past uh, for, you, oh, you've got to go high stakes. You've got to make it bigger. You've got to, because this is how we sell books. Um, and it's nice to see a sort of general curve in publishing right now where I think really linked in with the pandemic. It, there's such a big surge of, you know, readers turning to coziness and like, you know, I don't, I have enough to worry about in the, in the world right now. I don't want to get stressed by my reading too. Um, and, you know, the, the success of Legends and Lattes and the very secret society of irregular witches, all of these wonderful cozy fantasy books is making everyone realize that, hey, you know, this is a thing people enjoy. And I'm really happy about that because it's what I always loved. I mean, I wrote the first draft of Scales and Sensibility back in 2010, actually. So, you know, I'm so happy it's finally found its time. I... So I think it's always been something people have wanted, right? But like, mm -hmm. it's hard to find this type of thing because there was not this category cozy fantasy. It was absolutely sci-fi or fiction. Like <laughs> this is what I had growing up, and then eventually yes. they had young adult fiction, and I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I love absolutely. That. It's in there, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, there have always been like the occasional wonderful cozy fantasy books like I can think of some from Patricia McKillop that were published back in the 80s and you know and I think Pamela Dean and some other ones but they never got the big shove they never got the big push and became you know the big bestsellers or anything yeah I don't know I I was always surprised that it wasn't as popular as it was because like with these books there is a cross section, a large cross section of people who enjoy fantasy and mm -hmm. like household things, problems that you absolutely find at home. Um, so. <laughs> yes, yeah. Sometimes I, as a reader, you know, I find it easier to attach sometimes to problems that aren't going to end the world if things go wrong. You know, sometimes what actually matter, what it can actually hook my heart as a reader far more intensely is, okay, the rest of the world is going to keep going, but my little private world is going to break. You know, that's a much scarier thing in a book sometimes. And, you, you know, the stakes don't have to be world altering, you know, to actually matter very intensely to a, a character. Well, usually the world altering part comes late in the game. Like the author was told by their publisher or their editor, you need to have something bigger going on. And I'm like, oh, yes. I didn't need to, though. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, and it's funny because um, <laughs> I'm trying to think of how much I can say or not. Uh, but it was funny because I actually I did have a talk with one of my publishers um, several years ago in a different genre and they said look we need you to move away from cozy we want epic you know we want you know the world is at stake is what we need and we do you know and you need and this is what you need to do you know to you know to grow as an author and you know sell more copies and etc and and that is actually how I came up with one of my middle grade fantasy series and I do love those books I, I put a lot of my heart into them but it's been so nice to like when with the rise of cozy fantasy I and other a lot of other authors just let out this huge sigh of relief <laughs> because like finally we can do what you know comes naturally <laughs> and have fun with it and and not be going against publishing wishes you know well yeah that's the scary part too is like well, do you want to self-publish? Because there's a lot of people who just don't have the means or the knowledge to self-publish. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And it, it can be really difficult to write what you want to write. So I'm I'm just thrilled that it's, <laughs> it's going so well. <laughs> Absolutely. And honestly, I am just so happy for the rise of self-publishing as an option because I've been a hybrid publisher for the last several years with you know self-publishing some traditionally publishing others and it is such a nice mix because it just gives flexibility and you know when I say oh my publishers push me to write more of one kind of thing you know that's not actually really a complaint because I am grateful to have people trying 
you know, to help my career. And I'm grateful for every one of my publishers who's pushed, you know, my books and made them better. But also it is such a relief to say, okay, well, maybe I would not, this is this quirky concept that really appeals to me. I'm not sure we could convince a whole committee at a publisher, you know, the marketing and sales team that this is going to sell 10,000 copies, but I really want to write it. And now I have a way to do it and give it out to the world. And it turns out there's this whole niche readership that loves it and was looking for something like that. <laughs> I love Patreon for that. It feels like yes. I can like give money to get this book published that I really want and love. And the author's seem to be really part of the Patreon community, the ones that I'm part of anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I, how do you feel about the, uh, the interaction on Patreon? I love Patreon and I love how it's let me feel playful with writing again. I would never have written the Good Neighbors series if I hadn't had Patreon because it's again, too quirky an idea to, um, to ever convince a trad publisher and I don't think I think I would have been too worried to try to you know I would think oh this is too quirky even for self-publishing maybe <laughs> and I loved it but his good neighbors the concept is you know as you know because you've read it but um, for anyone who hasn't read it it's a series of stories that tell an overall story that, that was finally collected into a book called good neighbors so it's like a, a tv mini series you know with four episodes <laughs> and you know even it's like, I thought about, could I self-publish each story like through Amazon and Kobo and so on? And I couldn't because weird payment structures without getting into, <laughs> too deep in the weeds about this, it just would have been ridiculous. It wouldn't have been worth it. But Patreon gave me a way to have so much fun playing with these characters and this world. And it was actually a perfect way to share it because I'd write one story and then I'd immediately give it to my Patreon. And, you know, we'd talk about it and all this stuff. And then I'd write the next story a couple, you know, a month or two later. And it was a, it just, it was such a rewarding way to write it. And it felt like I was creating in community and it, it was just such a fun way to do a project that I couldn't have financially justified, you know, playing with otherwise. Yeah, I think. So I think the financial part is really important for Patreon, but also it feels like um, I've talked to a couple of other authors who said it just helps to have a connection to the people who read it and are like, mm -hmm. I love this. And it like gives them a boost of they want to keep writing these stories because there are people that want them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it just helps so much to know there are people who want to read them. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And to get to, I'm, I'm just trying to think of the right way to express it, but it's just so much fun to say, hey, here are these people who like the same quirky things I do and let's play with it. And I can play with it and feel like I'm giving them a gift, but they're giving me a huge gift. Not to, I mean, not even on the financial level, which is huge, but, you know, but by welcoming it and by talking about it on Patreon and being this community that's all sort of enjoying this project together. Yeah. Um, what are you working on right now? I am working on, well, I just finished revising two different short stories that are being published in the next couple of months. Um, the first one's being published uh, August 13th on Sunday Morning Transport, which is this fantastic uh, magazine that sends a science fiction fantasy short story every Sunday to your inbox. <laughs> and that is a rom-com, fantasy rom-com called Yours Wickedly, <laughs> which is really fun to write. And there's another short, short story that's coming out from the magazine Beneath Ceaseless Skies uh, in September. And then I have written up a proposal and the first 10,000 words of my next novel. And I think, uh, I'm trying to think again of like how much to say or not to say. This is one that I think is going to probably go with trad publishing. So I can't talk in detail about it. But the great thing is because it's an adult book that I have the wonderful flexibility when I submit that I can say, oh, if I don't like the offer, I'll just publish it myself. You know, it, and that is such a liberating kind of feeling to have. And in the meantime, I'm also, of course, reading up lots and lots of books on women mathematicians because, you know, I've got book three of the Regency Dragons, you know, simmering in my head. Um, most of your adult fiction has been self-published, right? 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, my first two books were trad published by Pyre Books. And, you know, it was, uh, I loved everyone I worked with there, but it was a small publisher. It's a small press publisher, basically, although it was connected to Penguin Random House, um, which meant that when I decided to self-publish my first novella, and it was because I didn't have time at that point. I, I'd signed contracts for my next middle grade fantasy trilogy. I needed to get all those done in time. I had two young kids, one of whom was still a baby. I was like, I can't write one adult book and one middle grade book a year without dying. You know, this is not going to happen. So I thought, well, I don't want to give up my adult readers. So I'll just write a novella, which turned out to be snow spelled. You know? And um, so when I did that, I thought, well, should I try to publish it or self-publish it? And all the traditional publishing options that I found at that point were like $200 for a novella. And I was like, no, you know, it's 40,000 words. I spent this many months. I'm not giving it away, you know? Um, and Alona Andrews, who's wonderful, the Alona part of Alona Andrews, <laughs> I should say, <laughs> since it's Alona and Gordon, but the Alona uh, really strongly recommended that I self-publish that one rather than traditional publishing. And she gave me a huge sort of mentorship boost. And when I published it, I made more on that novella than I had for my first two trad published books. <laughs> and that was very persuasive. Um, so that was <laughs> that was why I, I have self-published the last several of my adult works, even the full-length novels like Scales and Sensibility. And We'll see. I'm I'm not one of those people who's like, oh yes, I will always only right. self-publish in this genre, or I will always only trad publish. Basically, every project that I think of, you know, I'm like, okay, well, what would make sense? So, you know, Good Neighbors, it just immediately, this is a Patreon project. This is fantastic, you know, and Scales and Sensibility. I really wanted to get it out. I had some time pressures and I can't even remember because it was during the pandemic. So, you know, my brain is I think I blocked out large chunks of my memory because it was traumatic. But um, I had this time pressure. I was like, well, you know, my agent actually wanted me to give it to her and, and send out for trad publishing. And I was like, I don't want to wait. I want to actually get this out to my readers now. And, you know, I'd also like to get paid sooner than later, you know, et cetera. <laughs> so, but, you know, and in this particular case right now, um, my agent did talk me into with the sort of rise of cozy fantasy and romanticy and so on, um, my agent did convince me that we ought to submit uh, a proposal for, to trad publishers and just see. So we will see. We'll see which one it ends up being. <laughs> but it's, like I said, it's very liberating to be able to say, okay, well, do I want to trad publish or do I want to self-publish? Because that's, that's a really good position to be in as opposed to just, oh God, I have to do this, you know? Yeah, and it seems like... Um... Tor in particular are picking up mm -hmm. some published books. Um, more Lots of wonderful publishers. Yeah. I mean, Olivia Atwater, I think, is with Orbit and Elise Kova. Um, I can't remember who she just sold to, but <laughs> yeah, it, it basically it's lovely to have the flexibility. And I would never, I have to say at this point, the one thing that would stop me from selling a book traditionally would be if there was a non-compete clause that said I couldn't self-publish on the side, that would be a deal breaker for me because as a freelance author and as someone who's trying to raise a family and pay rent, <laughs> and with, there is a cost of living crisis going on in the UK right now. You know, I, I would never commit to saying, oh, I can only make money from my books in one particular way because then you're stuck and the rent is still going up. <laughs> I imagine the middle school books are easier to like publish traditionally than maybe self-publish because I, I feel like it would be more it's difficult definitely yeah it's much much easier to self-publish adult books because there's just so few middle school students you know who are reading their books on kindle and finding them you know it, it basically middle grade books are generally found through school libraries or public libraries or on bookstores by parents or other relatives you know giving gifts and for discoverability it would be sh so hard yeah. to self-publish and I, I do know some people do a wonderful job marty dema self-published a bunch of wonderful middle grade fantasy books before she's now switched over and is now trad publishing because she got scooped up <laughs> because they could see how well she was doing even as self-publishing um but i have to say i have never yet dared to try 
you know, self-publishing any middle grade books, that just sounds like a lot of work for not enough results, you know, as opposed to what a traditional publisher can give you. Uh, part of the difficulty with self-publishing is finding art and like all of the other things that the publisher would do. Um, but you found this wonderful artist for scales and sensibility and claws and contrivances. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's so much fun coming up with the art for all this stuff. And it's, you know, on the one hand, that's an expense when you're self-publishing. But on the other hand, it's also, there's, again, the field of liberation because I get to choose. <laughs> and I've been really lucky with that because I managed to get a wonderful cover designer, Raven, to do the covers for the Regency Dragons books. Uh, but then also I found through some writer friends, actually, um, as a fantasy romance author, S.L. Pratter, whose books I really enjoy. Um, and she recommended the artist she's worked with to do character art, who's uh, Rafa Strife. And he does beautiful character art and it was just so much it was like a little <laughs> gift for myself really <laughs> to say I could you please do character art for Rose and Mr. Aubrey and this is you know the kind of situation and and uh try to make her look vaguely like you know the woman on the cover but you know <laughs> otherwise you know you had a lot of freedom and it was it's such a delight and it's a thing that I'm so pleased is becoming a normal thing in the fantasy romance community because it's honestly just so much fun like I I I could I gave my husband, you know, the practical explanation of like why this is a good investment. <laughs> and then I was like, oh my God, my characters have them. You know? I love those. Those are like the best book gifts, you know, like little clips uh, or images from the book. And I'm like, oh my God, I love these so much. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining me today. <laughs> thank you so much for having me on here. I really enjoyed it. Um... Claws and Contrivances is out now, I believe. Well, thank you and have a great day. Bye. Thank you so much.